Okay, students, thermodynamics lesson three, bomb calorimetry and unconventional units. Okay, remember uh, that we're going to be talking about calorimetry data and enthalpy changes. Okay, bomb calorimeters. We, we talked about these last time a little bit, but uh, this is a, just a, a simple Chem 30 calorimeter, a styrofoam cup. Bomb calorimeters... Oh, or a pop can, right? We can use that. We can burn a chip underneath a pop can. Heat loss equals heat gained. Now, those aren't real accurate. Bomb calorimeters are very accurate and precise. So let's let's talk about how they work. Okay. Uh, the reaction takes place in an inner metal chamber or a bomb. So this is the bomb. This is a chamber filled with oxygen. And we put our sample in there. Maybe we burn a, a, a cookie. <laughs> we put the cookie in there. We burn it. There's lots of oxygen, so it burns well. Gives heat to the water. We measure the temperature change in the water. And we can do our calculation. Heat loss equals heat gained. Um, the bomb is filled with pure oxygen. The substance we want to burn. And there's ignition wires in there to start the reaction. Uh, because a bomb calorimeter has so many components, we do not ignore the heat absorbed by the calorimeter itself. So let me back up here. When we do a lab like this, we burn this chip underneath here, and heat is lost to the environment, and we're not calculating the heat that goes into the thermometer. Sometimes students might not even calculate the heat that goes into the aluminum. But in a bomb calorimeter, we calculate all of it. We can calculate how much heat goes into the water. We calculate how much heat goes into the stirrer, into the container itself, even the thermometer. Now, um, all of those all those calculations and measurements are done for us in a bomb calorimeter. We've already included in our calculation the mass of the thermometer, the mass of the stirrer, the specific heat capacity of each thing. And so we have this new Q formula. Q equals capital C delta T. C is heat capacity. Not little c, specific heat capacity. Big C is heat capacity. And its units are kilojoules per degree, per degree Celsius. Not joules per gram degree Celsius. The mass has been divided out, multiplied out for us. Okay, so that is very important. Q equals C delta T. And we deal with... Um, uh, big C, which is heat capacity. Or we could do all that by hand. We could calculate the MC delta T of the water, the MC delta T of the stirrer, the MC delta T of the container. But in a bomb calorimeter, that's all been done for us. Okay, so bomb calorimetry questions are actually really easy. In an experiment using a bomb calorimeter, the temperature was found over as 22.5 to 29. If the calorimeter had a heat capacity of 6.03 kilojoules per degree Celsius, what was the total energy released? Okay, we want to find the total energy released. We want to find the change in energy. Well, that would be Q, MC delta T, or in this case, C delta T. Okay, so to find C delta T, we then take the C, which they gave us, 6.03 kilojoules per degree Celsius, times by the temperature change of 6.5, <laughs> cancel our units, <laughs> really easy, 1079.672. Delta H is 1.08 kilojoules. That's how much energy was released. And uh, we, we should have a negative there as well, right? Um, because it didn't say, well, I, I should say we could have a negative there. If you put it in, you would not be wrong. It's asking for total energy released. So the energy released was 1.08 kilojoules. If it asked in particular for molar enthalpy or enthalpy, then we would want to make sure we put the negative in. Okay, here's another experiment. You got an aluminum can calorimeter a student uses. And uh, the can weighs 16.5 grams with 20 milliliters of water. If the temperature rises by 11 degrees, what's the total energy released by the experiment? Okay. So, uh, we don't know what the initial temperature was and what the final temperature was. We just know it changed by 11. It went up by 11. Okay, so delta T is 11. 
Okay, I want to find energy. I want to find delta H. Now, I know I have the Q of my water, MC delta T of water, and MC delta T of aluminum. So my water is 20 times 4.19 times 11. And now I have to add to that my aluminum because heat goes not only into just the water, heat also goes into the tin can or the aluminum can. Heat also goes to the air and we're losing that and that's just a source of error. Heat is going into the thermometer but we're not, we don't know the specific heat capacity of the thermometer and we're not going to worry about that. So that will be a source of error. Anyway, we cancel all of our units and I have 921.8 joules, 157.872 joules. That's 1,079 joules, and my delta H is 1.08 kilojoules. Remember, they just asked for how much energy is released, so we don't have to put negative in. If they had to ask for molar enthalpy, then we would want to put it in. Okay. Now, sometimes a calorimeter can be used to calculate energy for substances that we cannot calculate a chemical formula or a molar mass for you may solve for kilojoules per gram or some other unit. Okay, so watch this. I got a peanut, <laughs> a giant, massive peanut. I light it on fire, and heat goes into a pop can. Okay, heat lost by the peanut equals heat gained by the water. Let's say I want to find the molar enthalpy, the delta HM, the kilojoules per mole for a peanut burning. All right? So my formula would be MC delta T, over m mass divided by molar mass. Okay. And now we have a problem. What is the molar mass of a peanut? We could plug in our mass of water. We can find that. We can weigh it, plug that in, temperature change. We could even weigh the peanut. But we don't know the molar mass of a peanut because we don't know the formula for a peanut. What's the formula for a peanut? It's going to have some carbohydrates in it, CHO, like C6H2O6. But it has other things in it. It's got proteins in it. It's got oils in it. It's got, like, what's the molar mass? So we can't calculate it, practically. Because we will not be calculating the molar mass of a peanut, we will simply divide by the mass of the peanut burned. So watch this. Let's say that peanut weighed 1.10 grams. And after I burn it, there's leftover of 0.75 grams. Well... It's not this mass we want to use, and it's not this mass. It's the difference. That's what was actually burned, right? So we take the mass initial, subtract the mass final, and then we can find kilojoules per gram. So you'll see in one of our experiments, we're going to burn a peanut or a pecan or some kind of a nut, and we'll figure out the kilojoules per gram. Okay, so unconventional units.